Good morning. It's uh, Sunday, November 17th, Tucson, Arizona, and it is time to start infant baptism in Reformation Geneva, The Shaping of a Community, 1536 to 1564. This is a book by Karen Spearling, and uh, she's got some other books being published on the near horizon, but we'll start with chapter one, which is the introduction, infant baptism, and the definition of a community. According to Jean Crispin's History of the Martyrs, the Reformed Church in Paris first came into being for the sake of a baptism. From the reign of Henry II in the 1550s, the Sieur de la Ferriere fled from Maine to Paris in search of greater religious tolerance. In 1557, La Ferriere found himself in Paris and the father of a newborn child, with no Reformed church in which to baptize the infant. In search of a solution, he called together the group with whom he gathered to pray and read the Bible. In Crespin's words, La Ferriere did not want the child whom God had given him to be baptized according to the superstitions and ceremonies of the Roman church. He begged his colleagues not to allow the infant that God had given him to be deprived of the baptism by which the children of Christians should be consecrated to God. In order to prevent this, he asked them to elect a minister from among themselves who could perform the child's baptism. Informal gatherings sufficed for prayer and study, but the sacrament of baptism required a minister and the preaching of the word. When La Ferriere's fellow adherents of the, reform, of the reform hesitated, he responded that he could not in good conscience consent to the corruptions of the Roman Catholic baptism, but that it was impossible to take the child all the way to Geneva for a proper reform ceremony. If the child died without this mark, he said, he would call them all before God's judgment for having refused such a just request. Finally persuaded, the group elected one of their members, Jean Lamasson, as minister, and thus Crespin reported the Reformed Church in Paris had its beginnings. Whether or not it is entirely historically accurate, the brief story illustrates the importance of infant baptism in 16th and 17th century reform practice and suggests a number of the concerns and puzzles attached to the practice. It highlights two main themes of this book. The importance of the Reformed Christians in the 16th century, the importance that Reformed Christians in the 16th century placed on initiating children into the church and the role of baptismal ceremony in defining the church community. The first responsibility that a Reformed parent had to his or her newborn child was to arrange for the baby's baptism by a minister in front of a congregation. This was not a matter of the salvation of the child's soul, according to Reformed theology, Baptism was not necessary for salvation. It was, rather, the first step in the incorporation of the child into the Reformed community and the public acknowledgement of that community's responsibility to the child. La Ferriere's request of his fellow Reformed Christians in Paris did more than just provide the necessary official to baptize his child. In appointing one of themselves as minister, the group of worshipers established themselves as a congregation and therefore as the community that would welcome, nurture, and educate La Ferriere's new baptized child. The following chapters examine this role of baptism in defining a religious community, specifically the Reformed Christian community of 16th century Geneva. By early 1530s, Geneva was a civic and religious community in transition establishing independent control of both its government and its church. The success of this undertaking depended in part upon the nurture and development of a loyal and devout population who would be prepared to lead and defend both church and civic institutions. Baptism was the first mark of entrance into this religious and civic community, and the first public proclamation of who would be responsible for raising a particular child according to reformed Genevan beliefs and laws. The survival of an independent Geneva, and especially of the religious reformation its government embraced, depended upon the transformation of the views, beliefs, and practices of the existing population, comprised of people with their own priorities, anxieties, and opinions. This book is concerned particularly with the goals and concerns of Genevan parents regarding their children, the ways that those interests 
challenged and coincided with the various priorities of church and city leaders. As we'll see, most 16th century Genevan parents continue to value the baptism of their children, but not always for the precise reasons set out by the ministers. The following chapters will argue that rather than being simply imposed from above or resisted from below, the definition of the Genevan Reformed community was an ongoing process of negotiation among church leaders, civic leaders, and the parents and relatives of the children being raised in that community. This negotiation affected both the practice of baptism and the articulation of the theology underpinning the sacrament. All of the groups involved in this ongoing process, reformers, city leaders, parents, demonstrated flexibility at certain moments, but all also had limits beyond which they were unwilling to compromise. One goal of the following discussion is to discover those limits, to understand how compromise emerged within that framework, and to consider what happened when a discussion or confrontation broke those boundaries. The Reformation was a time when definitions mattered. It was a period when scholars spilled much ink and animated many debates over the precise meanings of specific words in Scripture, their order, their meaning, their value. Jesus' uh, command to follow his, rather, Jesus' command to his followers to make disciples of all nations, baptizing, teaching them, provided fodder, for intense arguments over which should come first, baptism or education, or baptism or faith. From a historical perspective, the irony of this focus on finding precise definitions and single answers is that much of the intrigue of the Reformation lies in the multifacetedness of many of its rituals and events. As in other periods, the events and actions of the Reformations embodied layers of meanings, some acknowledged in writing of the time and some not. Theologically, the relationship between God and the baptized individual may have been the most important part of the sacrament. Historically, however, other relationships are intertwined with this one. Pulling parents, godparents, clergy, congregation, and even city authorities into the picture. Particularly during the Reformation, baptism lay at a nexus of ties among all of these people. The goal of this work is to unravel that knot and trace the threads that bound these individuals and authorities to the child being baptized and to one another. The discussions, confrontations, and arguments over baptism examined here will provide a window into the place of children in 16th century Geneva, Genevan society, and thus an important point of comparison with other reformed communities across Western Europe. Baptism as sacrament. 16th century Protestant reformers kept two of the traditional seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. From Luther to Calvin and beyond, Protestant leaders defended this decision on the basis of scriptural mandate, asserting that the New Testament contained direct orders only for the Lord's Supper and baptism. Fighting continued throughout the 16th century between Catholics and Protestants, and among different groups of Protestants, regarding the exact definition and significance of a sacrament. In nearly all of these discussions, a sacrament was important as a moment of a particular connection between God and human beings, whether as individual Christians or as a group. One of the main theological obstacles to reunification among Protestants, or between Protestants and Catholics, was disagreement regarding how to define and understand this connection. What is consisted in how it was achieved, and what distinguished the sacramental experience from other moments in life. In terms of baptism, this argument was in some way a subtle one among mainline Protestants, and perhaps even surmountable between Protestants and Catholics. All of these groups agreed that infants should be baptized, and that baptism was a sacrament. However, that might be defined. But with the emergence of various Anabaptist sects in the 1520s, the propriety of baptizing infants came clearly into question. Various radical reformers insisted upon believer's baptism, which is the baptism of adults, as the only valid form of the sacrament, and asserted that infant baptism was meaningless because that infant had no comprehension of what was happening. These groups quickly became associated with social and political unrest in Germany and Switzerland, a development that brought theological discussions and defenses of infant baptism to the force, as mainline reformers sought to demonstrate that they were not radicals. From that point on, 
as the various forms of Christianity have spread across the world, baptism has continued to be one of the most obvious and public points of dissensions among Christian denominations and sometimes within them. <clears throat> I would argue that this is precisely because baptism is tied so closely at one and at the same time to defining the relationship between an individual and God and to define the shape and limits of a given Christian community. I don't know what Karen's uh, background is. I, d I don't know that she's a believer, but um, I like her observations that uh, this is the case with baptism, that it defines the relationships uh, between individuals and God and individuals and their community. Historically, and in the 20th first century, baptism simultaneously sets a person apart and incorporates him or her into a community. It does make you wonder, though, in a uh, Baptist tradition, or in a credo baptistic tradition, uh, what is the nature of the child to the community? until they make a public profession. For 16th century Anabaptists, it was vital that an individual choose to make a commitment to the Christian community. For Jean Calvin uh, and his 16th century colleagues and followers, the sacrament of baptism was a public sign of, the, of this commitment of both God and the human Christian community to an infant too young and unaware to understand or articulate his or her own need for that support. Baptism is sometimes labeled the other sacrament, implying that it is secondary to the Lord's Supper in terms of religious and spiritual significance. And yet baptism is foundational to the Christian community, and more specifically to the sacrament of the Eucharist. In Christian churches in the 16th century and today, baptism was and is a requirement for participation in the Lord's Supper. That's generally true, but oftentimes not enforced in non-reformed traditions, uh, whether or not a denomination welcomes all baptized Christians or only individuals baptized according to the traditions of that particular church, baptism is the universally recognized sign that a person is a member of a community that partic partakes of the Lord's Supper. As we'll see, the significance of baptism becomes especially important in Reformed Geneva, where many city authorities, as well as church leaders, view the dis discipline imposed by the consistory as vital to the survival of both the church and the civic community. In order to be fully subject to the discipline, an individual first had to either be baptized and subsequently converted Catholic, who had, who had proven his or her devotion to the Reformed faith, or some initially baptized according to the Reformed doctrine. Let me try that again. In order to be fully subject to, the, to that discipline, an individual first had to be either a baptized and subsequently converted Catholic who had proven his or her devotion to the Reformed faith or someone initially baptized according to the Reformed doctrine. So in the Reformed tradition, Catholic baptism, Roman Catholic baptism, is a, an acceptable form of baptism. Baptism and those converts to the Reformed tradition were not rebaptized. Thus, baptism was not the other sacrament, but first the but rather the first sacrament, the one that allowed the sacrament of the Eucharist to exist and to function effectively, whether as a ritual of communal unity, an affirmation of the relationship between individual Christians and God, or in most cases both at the same time. While some comprehension of the sacramental nature of baptism is fundamental to this study, my e examination of the, of the subject differs from previous works on baptism and its effect to address and incorporate both theological and social influences and concerns without privileging one over the other. In taking this approach, I am much indebted to earlier scholar, scholarly works on baptism that have focused largely on theological arguments and liturgical changes. In particular, I have made great use of J.D.C. Fisher's fundamental studies on baptism in the medieval and Reformation periods in Europe, which focus on liturgical cha changes across a thousand years. So this book is uh, very well um, footnoted, which I, I quite like. And so the footnote here for J.D.C. Fisher's fundamental studies on baptism is his book, Christian Initiations, Baptism in the Medieval West, and then uh, that was published in 1965. 
And then in 1970, he wrote Christian Initiation in the Reformation Period. So that will be fun to explore. Just, I'll just continue reading this footnote. The first book presents a comprehensive narrative, while the second is a collection of Reformation liturgies and other documents. For extensive, albeit partisan, treatment of the history of baptism, see Jules Corblet. Corble. Uh, it's a book in French, which I won't offend, because... I usually try to say it with enough authority, uh, just to keep moving in the text, but I know I'm butchering uh, most non-English words in this books. So that doesn't appear to be translated. Uh, but there's another book mentioned in this footnote that says, A recent and interesting example of the theologically focused study of baptism is Jonathan D. Triggs' Baptism in the Theology of Martin Luther. And that was published in 1994, although that's a Braille publication. And anything with Braille is at least 100 to 200 bucks for a printed copy of the book, which seems reasonable, of course. All right, moving on. In a work specifically on the medieval period, Peter Kramer has analyzed some of those baptismal litur liturgical changes with the aim of understanding the significance of the liturgy in and of itself, rather than focusing on the importance as a contextual product or as a tool for imposing social order. That's Peter Kramer's Baptism and Change in the Early Middle Ages. That was published in 1993. Social stability, and most certainly was a concern in the 16th century Geneva, as well as in medieval Europe. I will argue here that the baptismal ceremony was one aspect of this effort, although a flexible one that never operated in only one direction. Nonetheless, as Kramer asserts strongly, we cannot fully understand that facet of the ritual without understanding or at the very least acknowledging the religious faith on which it was based. Another vital resource for this project is Hughes Oliphant Old's analysis of 16th century reform baptismal rites, which provides somewhat more consideration of historical context than Fisher does. If you've watched other videos on this channel, that's another book we're going through currently. We're only into chapter two or three. But that is an excellent book. <clears throat> His thorough discussion and comparison of the German and Swiss baptismal liturgies demonstrates the ways in which the Reformers influenced one another's thinking. While he emphasizes the Reformers' theological and biblical justification for their liturgies, Old's work suggests that the Reformed baptismal ceremony is developed at an intersection of theological doctrine and social context. He makes the point that one of the Reformers' goals was to address the pastoral realities of administering the baptismal rite to infants. For example, adjusting to the fact that the child in question was not old enough to make a vow of faith. Old's aim is not, however, to analyze closely this relationship between doctrine and context. The present study, in contrast, seeks to understand precisely those realities of congregational life that help to shape the baptismal ceremony, which makes this book a fun complement to reading um, Old's book at the same time. Most recently, John Riggs has examined the evolution of a Reformed baptismal doctrine and liturgy from the perspective of a historical theology. And that's the footnote here is John W. Riggs' Baptism in the Reformed Tradition and historical and practical theology. It's um, Westminster John Knox Press, 2002. I have not found these books before, so I intend to order them all immediately. So that's John Riggs. He examines the roots of Calvin's own doctrine, that of other German and Swiss reformers, Luther, Zwingli, and Busser, and then lays out the development of Calvin's baptismal theology during his tenure in Geneva. The goal of Riggs' study is to understand Calvin's theology, to look at the influence of that theology on various Reformed churches up to the present, and to draw conclusions about the validity of those theological ideas and the baptismal practices attached to them. While Riggs' work has been an important resource for my own consideration of Calvin's theology, the present work examines that same doctrine more thoroughly rooted in its historical context, seeking not to judge the correctness of the theology itself, but rather understand both the effect of the doctrine on the Genevan church and society and the influence of that church and society on Calvin's baptismal doctrine. 
I love this book already. Baptism as Birth Ritual. If this were solely a theological work on baptism, our discussion would focus on an analyzing the sacramental nature and significance of infant baptism. But if we were to use baptismal practices as a window into the wider issue of the place and incorporation of children into Reformed Genevan society, we cannot consider that ceremony only as a religious sacrament. We must also view it as a birth ritual a community tradition and a public acknowledgement of both an official and legal family and of anyone beyond that specific nuclear family who held responsibility for the upbringing of the child in question. I'm going to read that again. Baptism, she's referring to, uh, must be referred, uh, must also be viewed as, baptism must be viewed as a birth ritual, a community tradition, and public acknowledgement of both an official and legal family and of anyone beyond that specific nuclear family who held responsibility for the upbringing of the child in question. The goal of this work is not to assert that one aspect of baptism was more important than the others, but rather to draw some useful conclusions about how the various meanings and roles of baptism interacted with one another and helped to shape the Reformed Genevan community. Uh, in addition to being one of the only two sacraments, the baptismal, baptismal ceremony represented the one public birth ritual in the Reformed Church. As such, it might be interpreted according to Arnold Van Gennep's classic notion of a rite of passage. And she here footnotes his book, The Rites of Passage. That's a 1960 book. And then also mentions Will Coster's Baptism and Spiritual Kinship, Kinship in Early Modern England. That's a 2002 publication. This approach is complicated, however, by the passive nature of the child in question and by the number of other people involved, for whom the ceremony might also be seen as a rite of passage. In his work on Renaissance Italy, Louis Haas remarks on this complexity. Quote, Human birth possesses religious, political, ritual, and dynastic significance that reflects the very structures of society. Moreover, birth involves more people than just the mother and infant. A birth weaves together immediate family members, more distant relatives, friends, and even strangers, as well as medical and religious professionals. Unquote. And that's from Louis Haas's book, The Renaissance Man and His Children, Childbirth and Early Childhood in Florence, 1300-1600, and that's a 1998 publication. Like any birth ritual, baptism marks the entrance of a newborn child into a community. Birth rituals commonly involve purification, cleansing the child of other worldly spirits it might have encountered before its birth. Well, that's certainly not the case in the Reformed tradition, but the exorcisms that Olds covers in his book of the um, Roman baptisms certainly would suggest that. Depending on the culture and religion, the intention may be to cleanse the child specifically of sin, as in the Christian concept of original sin. So that's in a regenerative view of baptism, which is not held by the Reformed tradition. Or more generally of contamination from the contact with the spirit world. That is not a Reformed practice or tradition either. Um, the ritual might also entail the first official naming of the baby, as did the Reformed baptismal ceremony. The significance of the rite does not, however, end with the child, who is a passive participant and retains no memory of the ceremony. If a birth ritual marks the first official entrance of a child into a society, it also marks the first official acknowledgement of the mother and father as parents either as the first-time parents or as parents of this particular child for the first time. Depending on the ceremony and those involved, the ritual might also mark the initiation of a variety of other relationships within the society, all centered upon, or at least related to, the child. Viewed in this way, baptism is better understood as several rites of passage bound together in one ritual. Several rites of passage bound together in one ritual. But before we dismiss the precision or usefulness of the concept of a rite of passage for this particular study, we should consider a related interpretive tool, 
Victor Turner's analysis of the process of ritual. Turner described Van Gennep's middle stage, the liminal period, as one in which the participant, the right, is betwixt and between, no longer part of the world he or she began in, but not fully a member of the next one. And that's a, a book footnoted as The Ritual Process, Structure and Anti-Structure, in its original publication in 1969. It looks like it was republished in 1995. He associated the concept of communitas with the liminal stage, a period when a group of people experience together being disconnected from the normal structure of society. If we analyze infant baptism as a ritual in Turner's terms, we might conceive of the period of the ceremony in the church as a moment of communitas, separated, if only briefly, from the world outside the church walls. I'm not sure I follow what stage this is. This is the child before the child's baptized. I may be misunderstanding, but children were baptized so quickly after birth that Maybe such a brief moment. Of course, this interpretation does not apply perfectly to a situation in which the aim was not to separate oneself from society, to be with God, but rather to incorporate God into one's daily life within society. This very snag leads us to Brian Morris's argument that Turner's idea juxtaposes a fluid liminal stage, or rather a fluid liminal state, against an unchanging social structure. This... <clears throat> Morris says, is the main weakness of the concept. It does not leave room for flexibility within society itself. Mm -hmm. In the same way, the notion of a strict Reformed church structure within and against which people sought opportunities for resistance and the perpetuation of tradition places undue emphasis on the static nature of Reformed authority. <clears throat> Considering this, it seems reasonable to suggest that the most effective way to approach baptism as a ritual is based on the notions of practice theory. The notions of practice theory. Catherine Bell explains that, quote, rather than ritual as the vehicle for the expression of authority, practice theorists tend to explore how ritual is a vehicle for the construction of relationships of authority and submission. So we've got... Um, I'm going to reread that. Catherine Bell explains that rather than ritual as the vehicle for the expression of authority, practice theorists tend to explore how ritual is a vehicle for the construction of relationships of authority. So expressions of authority versus the constructions of relationships of authority and submission. And Catherine Bell's book would be Ritual, Perspectives and Dimensions, and that was published in 1997. Uh, the present book did not begin with a formal practice theory of ritual in mind. It's fascinating to me, these, uh, these are sociologists, or that's a sociological approach to the, the uh, Christian tradition and to the Reformation. And you get the impression that these are outside perspectives, trying to analyze the practices, and you know, I find it fascinating. Anyway... Ultimately, however, the evidence supports or at the very least coincides with such an approach. This study explores the ways that Genevan ministers, city leaders, and parents made use of the baptismal ceremony to construct and negotiate relationships of authority and power among themselves. In this way, this project is less a discussion of baptism as a birth ritual than it is an analysis of baptism as the beginning of a process which incorporated a child into the community and which entailed negotiation among all of the ceremony participants except the child. You know, it's not so much the case, I mean, at least in principle, in my experience, whatever that's worth, but um, the involvement of the congregation uh, to verbally articulate that at the child's baptism. But as far as an ongoing relationship into a community, um, I wish there was more involvement, but... Um, as guilty as that is any. Baptism as a social and religious tradition. The third element in the approach I've taken to examining baptism is an effort to understand baptism as a community tradition and a public and official acknowledgement of those responsible for the child. 
Over the last decade, a number of social and cultural historians of early modern Europe have investigated the sacrament and practice of baptism as part of a wider studies on Reformation practices or early modern life cycles, or the relationship between the two. For example, David Cressy discusses baptismal practices as part of his thorough study of the rituals, the life cycle in early modern England. In David Cressy's book, Birth, Marriage, and Death, Ritual, Religion, and the Life Cycle in Tudor and Stuart, France, is referenced in the footnote, and that was published in 1997. Drawing on an array of sources from prayer books to diaries, he provides a wealth of information about practices across the country. He does not, however, seek to explain the particular developments of a more narrowly defined community, as does this present study. In Susan Carrant Nunn's work on the Reformation of Ritual in 16th century Lutheran and Reformed Germany, she includes a chapter on baptism in which she examines public, published tracts and liturgies as well as some visitation records from across Germany. She argues that both Lutheran and Calvinist reformers were concerned with shaping earthly society. And she sets those efforts against the resistance of the many ordinary people who found some of the reformers' zeal both disconcerting and offensive. And that's uh, footnoted references, Susan Carrot Nunn's book, The Reformation of Ritual, An Interpretation of Early Modern Germany, and that was published in 1997. She also remarks that the community gathered at the baptismal ceremony might assist the child in navigating his or her way through a Christian life. Um, it just makes me want to read that book and see if there's uh, any depth or detail as to what that looks like for the Christian community to be actively involved in the ongoing life of a baptized child. This present book differs from Karen Not, uh, Karant Nunn's study and its focus on the consistory and the council records of a particular city, which is Geneva. This approach allows us to pursue similar questions, but to look more closely at the variations and nuances that existed in church members' reactions to changes in baptismal practices. A third scholar, Margot Todd, incorporates a chapter on the sacrament into her recent book on Protestant culture in Scotland. And um, that book is footnoted as Culture of Protestantism. Uh, she must have referenced this earlier because it doesn't give me a publication date. But that's Culture of Protestantism. Her work, based principally on the records of church sessions across Scotland, concludes that the church sessions, especially in the towns, were willing to exercise some flexibility in upholding reformed baptismal policies in order to accommodate the needs and concerns of church members. Todd's book provides an excellent resource in terms of her use of sources and exploration of, of the process and negotiation involved in the establishment and success of a reformed church, but the minimal role that baptism plays in that study, a choice clearly defended by her explanation of the lack of sources, demonstrates the need for studies such as the current one to explain the significance of baptism in Reformed communities. Other scholars have addressed baptism briefly as part of their consideration of early modern families or childhood, as Louis Haas uh, does in his book, The Renaissance Man and His Children which the footnote indicates was published in, no, it doesn't say, probably, because that was referenced earlier, but it also references Stephen Osment's When Fathers Ruled, and that was uh, Harvard University Press, published in 1983. Haas's work, based on sources including Ricordi Ricordanze, autobiographies and theological writings on birth and infancy provides a sense of what baptism and, and the other traditions and rituals attached to childbirth meant to parents in early modern Florence. While I did not have access to such personal sources in Geneva, the consistory and city council records have enabled me to examine more closely the dynamics of interaction among religious, city, and family authorities. Finally, some scholars have looked at baptism in order to learn more about traditions of godparents and spiritual kinship. The standard work on the development of the role of baptismal sponsors in the Middle Ages is Joseph Lynch's Godparents and Kinship in Early Medieval Europe, and that was published in 1986, according to footnote 
with this comment, Lynch explores similar themes, but with a more specific regional focus in Christianizing Kinship, Ritual Sponsorship in Anglo-Saxon England, and that was published in 1998. That seems like a fascinating read as well. Maybe we'll get that as, as we proceed. John Bossy also has examined the role of godparents in his influential work on early modern Europe. Uh, most recently, Will Coster has looked at baptismal registers in early modern England to learn more about social connections between parents and godparents and the changing role of spiritual kinship during the 16th and 17th centuries. That's Coster's Baptism and Spiritual Kinship. And that was published. It doesn't tell me. Okay. I'm going to pause and get more coffee, so I'll be right back. Okay, the present work differs from all of these in placing its focus squarely on the sacrament of baptism, as it was envisioned and practiced in Geneva, and following the evidence outward from there to discover, wherever possible, how the practice of baptism connected not only to religious concerns, but also to social political, and parental interests. Like Courant Nunn's work, this study examines the interaction between official authorities, religious and civic, and the general population. But the local focus of this study permits us to perceive a process of flexibility and negotiation similar to that revealed in England and Scotland by Cressy and Todd. The most important distinction between the aforementioned works and the book at hand is the integration of theology into the analysis. This study asserts that theological ideas were important not just on one side of the discussions to be considered, but as an element affecting and affected by all of those involved in the discussions regarding baptism in children and Geneva. The one recent work to take a similar approach is Michael Halverson's excellent dissertation titled Theology, Ritual, and Confessionalization, The Making and Meaning of Lutheran Baptism in Reformation Germany, 1520 to 1618. Halverson's focus is on the German nobility, but his approach and findings provide useful comparisons in the following chapters. In order successfully to integrate theology into a social, cultural, historical study, we must acknowledge the importance and influence of the religious beliefs of early modern Genevans, while placing those convictions firmly within their historical context. Often, when theologians and historical theologians write about baptism, their goal is to define what is truly happening, or to place the several meanings of baptism into some order of significance. A similar aim has led to debate among anthropologists and historical anthropologists regarding the distinction between what is really happening in a given ritual and what the participants think is happening. Uh, anthropologists and historical anthropologists. I've never heard that distinction before. Hmm. You would think all anthropologists would be historical anthropologists by definition, but what do I know? The present work sets aside the theological question of whether baptism is more important as a marker of the relationship between an individual and God, or as a sign of comfort and community unification for all of the participants in the rite. Likewise, this book does not approach its subject in order to contrast the reality of the situation with the way the various participants understood it. Rather, I have sought to produce a more complex and rich understanding of the practice of baptism and the care of children in Reformed Geneva by examining how the different meanings of baptism affected and interacted with one another and trying to discern the ways in which religious beliefs and theological conceptions influence the actions, developments, discussions, and debates attached to the practice of infant baptism. Well, I like that approach because uh, it is the actions and such that I think ultimately define what people believe at least in action, regarding the subject. The result of such an approach, to borrow the words of Brad Gregory, is intended to be one of the in which 16th century Christians would have recognized themselves not puzzled over modern or postmodern reconfigurations of who they are or who they were. Rather than judging the objective validity of the beliefs in question here or seeking the real motivation behind their perpetuation, this study seeks to comprehend the sometimes varying content of those beliefs, 
accept them as a reality in the lives of 16th century Genevans, and examine the effect of those beliefs on the children of Geneva and their place in the community. The broad goal of this approach is to preserve the complexity the broad goal of this approach is to preserve the complexity of the historical situation, not to oversimplify our interpretation by single sinking, seeking a single cause or explanation. Certainly not everyone in 16th century Geneva held precisely the same religious beliefs, but it is imperative that we accept religious belief as one equal among other, one equal among a variety of factors that influence the interpretation and practice of baptism and the definition of community in early modern Geneva. Children and families. We're almost at the halfway point, so I'm just going to read a, uh, two more pages, and then we'll pause for this morning. So this is children and families. This is still part of the introduction. While this study begins with a focus on the sacrament of baptism, its wider aim is to contribute to the histories of early modern families and children by looking at the liturgy and practice of infant baptism in Reformed Geneva as a blueprint for the care of, his ch of children in the community. As conceived by Jean Calvin and his uh, colleagues, she's using the French spelling of John for some reason, so if you're wondering why I keep saying that, the Genevan baptismal ceremony laid out certain relationships among church leaders, city magistrates, parents, and godparents, all of whom had a role to play in the upbringing of each Genevan child. Church leaders, city magistrates, parents, and godparents, all of whom had a role. It doesn't mention the congregation, though. So, in theory, and in fact, reveals a great deal about the priorities, plans, and self-understanding of that community. What we find in the study is that even in such a relatively homogenous society as 16th century Geneva, it is impossible to discern a single set of priorities or a single self-understanding. Instead, one encounters contrasting and conflicting concerns and priorities regarding the raising of children in Geneva and their incorporation into church and city. We will see that rather than one set of priorities overshadowing all others, the care of Genevan children was shaped by the interaction and mutual influencing of a variety of interests and concerns. In discussing issues that affected families and children, this book adds to a varied and still growing literature on family history. Beginning in the late 1960s, this literature was produced largely in support of what opposition to the, to the work of Philip Aries, perhaps, A R. I-E-S, in his Centuries of Childhood, which argued for a significant distinction between medieval and modern children in terms of experience and treatment. Aries' argument was taken up by later scholars more strongly and absolutely than he himself had made it, and the result is an idea still largely accepted among the general population, which is, parents of the past, that's pre-19th century, was not, they were not affectionate with their children hesitated to become emotionally attached to their children, and even abused their children more frequently than parents of today. I don't know what is the case, but that just seems intuitively true for some reason. I don't know why. Attached to this idea that children of the past were treated as small adults, did not learn to play as modern children do, and did not experience any sort of childhood that we would recognize today. And then uh, she footnotes, the best known works to pursue this line of argument is The Family, Sex, and Marriage in England, 1500 to 1800, that's written by Lawrence Stone, and published in 1977, or The Making of the Modern Family, which was published in 1975. While these ideas may coincide well with popular notions of modernity versus the past, a number of historians over the past decades have demonstrated that early modern European parents did love and become closely attached to their children, and that the concept of childhood is by no means a new one. The present book takes from this debate the assumption that in late medieval and early modern Europe, childhood did exist as a cultural construct. The evidence presented here supports the claim that most parents felt strong emotional ties to their children and considered them to be children, not simply smaller versions of adults. Thus, the intent of the study is not to debate whether or not this early modern society appreciated and loved its children, but rather to examine the different ways in which parents, church leaders, and city authorities all attempted to care for the children of Geneva and demonstrated their concern for the youth of Reform Geneva. This debate within family history has spurred the development of a related field, the history of children 
and childhood. That seems fascinating to me as well. One of the greatest challenges, this is the final paragraph we'll do it for today, one of the greatest challenges of that emerging area of study is finding evidence that can be used to write about the experience of children themselves in any given society. It's important to acknowledge from the beginning that this work provides no great discovery in that regard. This study does not substantially supplement the literature about the experience of children as recorded by the children themselves. Rather, it reveals a great deal about the place of children in Reform Geneva, which is to say, the place created for them by adults. Thus, the contribution to be made here is in greater understanding of how a particular society thought about its children, why it saw them in the way it did, and how it acted upon those ideas. This goal is similar to that of Haas, who examines the thoughts of early modern parents based upon personal records. The aims of this book also overlap with those of scholars such as Anne McCants and Thomas Safley, 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 S-A-F-L-E-Y, Safley, probably Safley, Thomas Safley, who have discovered a great deal about the attitudes of early modern authorities toward children throughout their examinations of the records of orphanages and city governments and their analysis of the allocation of economic resources to provide for cities' children. Still other works have sought to discover general societal attitudes toward early modern children <clears throat> by looking at prescriptive literature on the raising and education of children. The present study, in contrast, examines confrontations among parents and church and city authorities sometimes involving the children themselves, in order to learn more about how Genevans cared for their children and interacted with them in daily life. Which seems broader in scope than the uh, title of the book, Infant Baptism, but obviously that's a subset of what she's alluding to as the present study. So that's the first half of the introduction to uh, Karen Spieling's book. Spearling's book, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And then it'll transition into the second half which is defining, defining the community, reformed communities, consistories, Geneva, shape of the argument, and then we'll transition into chapter two. So this is Karen Spearling's book. It looks just like this, and you should go out and buy it because it's, it's already so good. <laughs>